Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains near Bab, Montana. Glacier National Park is only 4 miles to the west, and the U.S.-Canada border is 10 miles to the north. The town sits at 4,500 feet in elevation and rests in the shadow of peaks that tower over 9,000 feet high. West of the town, the valleys are packed with sprawling forests of pine, fir, and spruce trees, beautifully interrupted by patches of quaking aspen. Along the creeks and streams, willow and berry bushes screen elk, white-tailed deer, and moose. The predators in this area include black bears, cougars, coyotes, wolves, and grizzly bears. In recent years, it has been noted that grizzly bears are slowly making their way out of the mountains and along the riparian zones of rivers that were their previous habitat. With healthy populations existing in Yellowstone National Park as well as Glacier National Park, the bears are seeking habitat in the western Great Plains, slowly but surely. The black triangles on the map represent locations that grizzly bears have been spotted but are outliers from their designated habitat boundaries. If nothing else, this map shows that grizzly bears are not predictable and can move into territory without drawing a lot of attention. Around 7 a.m. on Friday, July 12, 2013, 71-year-old Patty Miller was out for a walk with her dogs. Her partners, Angus and Seamus, were of the Havanese dog breed. According to the American Kennel Club, these shaggy Cuban bundles of personality are only about a foot tall at the shoulder and might tip the scales at 13 pounds soaking wet on a tiny scale. They're off the charts when it comes to affection and companionship, but one thing they aren't that good at is fending off grizzly bears. Now, Patty had rented a trailer near the town of Bab for the last three years to be closer to her brother, and because she enjoyed it there. Her brother owned a fishing cabin about a quarter mile away from her trailer on the shores of Duck Lake. Each day, she and Seamus and Angus would go for a walk around the lake and enjoy the fresh air and rejuvenating scenery. This Friday was a great day, as the temperatures were in the upper 50s with no wind and fair skies. Just the kind of day that allowed a person to take in all that big sky. Angus was the larger of the two dogs, but when the dogs are that little, being bigger doesn't mean much. As Patty prepared for their walk, Angus was being stubborn and didn't want to go. He tried to hide and refused to come toward the door, which was unusual. He always liked to go for walks any time Patty would take them, and she figured he would warm up to the idea once he was outside. She put her cell phone holster on her belt, alongside her emergency whistle and her bear spray. Then she grabbed Angus and headed toward the door. The lake was fringed with trees, but the road was in the open, with good visibility on all sides. This may have been convenient to see anything nearby, like a bear or a moose, but it meant that the sun would beat down with greater intensity, even on cooler days. After a short walk, Patty began to warm up, so she decided to take her jacket off and tied it around her waist and walked on. As the trio continued to walk, Patty noticed that there were none of the natural sounds. No birds chirping or squirrels chittering. The quiet was eerie, but was broken by an ominous twig snap just a few yards away. Now, Patty had heard the basics of bear safety from her brother. He had warned her that if she ever ran into a bear, to keep her eyes low and avoid directly looking into their eyes. He had also discussed the best way to dispense bear spray, starting from the ground near you and raising the fog toward the bear to create a large cloud for the bear to run into. If all else fails, he told her, then fold yourself into a ball with your head and chest toward the ground and play dead. If she had a run-in with a bear that went beyond that, then she was on her own, as she didn't carry a firearm. Patty's head quickly swiveled toward the sound of the snapping twig, just as two fuzzy little grizzly cubs tumbled out of the bushes onto the road. For a moment, she was caught in wonder at how cute they were. Then she was filled with terror as she saw what was close behind them. Not more than thirty feet from Patty and her dogs, a huge grizzly sow was moving through the trees toward her cubs. As soon as the sow's eyes caught sight of Patty, she stood to her hind legs. 
Patty was terrified at the sight of the bear towering over her by several feet, and all of the cautions of what not to do when you encounter a bear flashed through her mind. They say don't panic, but an eight-foot-tall angry mama bear has a way of inducing that in a person's mind. They say stand your ground, but that would mean nothing short of a fist fight with an animal that outweighs you by several hundred pounds and is armed with huge claws and powerful jaws. They say get aggressive, but I'm sure anyone facing a giant bear has to search pretty hard to find that much courage. They say to avoid getting eaten by covering up vulnerable parts of your body, but that means the bear will have an opportunity to inflict serious damage to your body or kill you. They say play dead, and the bear will likely lose interest in you, but that would expose you to the same risks as the prior step. The sow let out a roar that would rattle the windows of cabins nearby, then dropped to all fours and bounded toward Patty. Thinking she'd met her end, Patty opted for a more primitive reaction than all the scientists and researchers advise. She dashed for the brush and dove in head first. Angus and Seamus weren't taking the coward's way out. They rallied to Patty's defense by jumping a few feet in the air for the chance of biting the bear's muzzle. As she ran, the sow swatted at the dogs, like a dairyman swatting flies. Patty reached her hand down to pull out her bear spray, but was too overwhelmed to retrieve it from its holster properly. The irony of seeing such beautiful scenery behind the angry grizzly charging toward her resonated in her mind for a brief second. Given she couldn't utilize her bear spray, Patty opted to try the curling into a ball strategy that her brother had discussed with her. She put her arms alongside her head and covered her neck with her hands. As she dropped to the ground, the sow swatted her right arm away from her head, tattering the flesh as her claws tore their path. Pain shot through her arm for a moment as she collapsed to the ground. The sow's teeth tore through her scalp in three destructive and rapid bites to Patty's head. Though she had managed to curl into a ball, the sow somehow flipped her over and out of the bushes in which she was sheltering. Now on her back and not in a ball anymore, Patty was completely vulnerable to the bear's will. With a single swat, the sow ripped four deep gashes that started near Patty's belly button and ran all the way up to her neck. Patty felt a rush of anger wash over her at the thought of her death just before she lost consciousness. A high-pitched and repeated bark was the next thing Patty heard. She opened her eyes to see Seamus staring at her, but he was alone. She instantly knew Angus was dead, or he would be right there beside Seamus. Pain racked her body. Her arm hurt like crazy and her head pounded, but she was alive, for now. While pulling herself to her feet, Patty clicked the latch on Seamus' leash. He lit out like he was fired from a cannon, heading for home. Patty knew she would have to get help quickly and decided to call 911 from her cell phone. It should be easy to get to her, given she was on the road, so she reached down to her cell phone holster on her belt. It was then that she realized that in her rushed departure and trying to gather Angus, she had forgotten to clip her cell phone into the holster. It was sitting on the counter back at her home, and would do her no good right now. Patty knew that her only option was to walk out to find help, or walk until help found her. She stumbled a few yards and was overcome with nausea and dizziness. Her head pounded with the sound of her blood rushing through veins and arteries. She reached down toward her belt once again, and this time retrieved her emergency whistle. Staggering her way down the dirt road, Patty blew her whistle and yelled until she was out of breath. By then the wind had picked up and drowned out her cries. She could feel herself slipping, and new shock was setting in, so she sat down to collect her senses. At 11.40 a.m. a truck bounced down the road toward Patty. She waved them down and asked them to help her. How she had survived the last three hours, she wasn't sure, but she wasn't about to let the first people she'd seen up to this point refuse. The truck was full of kids who had been invited to go fishing with their bus driver. They crowded around Patty and helped her into the truck while they called 911 on the school bus driver's cell phone. A short ways down the road, Patty's sister-in-law hailed the truck and asked if they'd seen a little dog. She was searching for Angus because Seamus had apparently ran to her house to get help for Patty. As soon as her sister-in-law saw Patty in the back of the truck, she jumped in with her. Placing her shirt over Patty's body and laying on top of her to keep her warm, her sister-in-law reassured Patty. About six miles down the road, an ambulance pulled into view as the truck skidded to a stop. The medics loaded Patty onto a gurney and into the back of the ambulance. 
Within 40 minutes, they pulled into the emergency room entrance at the Blackfeet Community Hospital in Browning. By this time, Patty's eyes had swollen shut from the damage done by the sow bites to her head. The staff cut away her clothes to examine her for additional wounds. They started an IV and administered four pints of blood. Realizing Patty's injuries were too serious for the small hospital, they arranged for a medical helicopter to fly her to Kalispell Regional Medical Center in Kalispell. As soon as the helicopter landed in Kalispell, Patty was rushed into the first of four operations she would have to endure over the coming few days. This one lasted for seven and a half hours, but she wasn't out of the woods just yet. During that surgery, the doctors would discover that the bear had severed nearly every muscle on the back of Patty's neck and missed her carotid artery by a fraction of an inch. It had ripped off one of her ears, crushed her jaw back into her skull, and fractured her cheekbones. Her nose was also broken, but that paled in comparison to the rest of her frightening injuries. During the surgeries, deep lacerations in her neck, the three bite wounds to her head, and deep gashes running up her body were cleaned and sutured shut. For three weeks, Patty slowly recuperated in the hospital, under constant observation from the staff of the intensive care unit. Reconstructive surgery was needed to insert 24 pins to put her facial bones back in place, but could do nothing to repair the severed nerve that opened her right eye. It remained permanently closed in a prolonged wink at the Grim Reaper. After many months of grueling rehabilitation, Patty indicated she's just grateful to be alive. Of all the possible outcomes, her injuries were the preferred option. She does miss her little Angus, though. His body was discovered by her neighbor and then laid to rest on Patty's brother's land, but she can't visit his grave. It's just too painful for her. Upon her release from the hospital, Patty returned to her trailer and its beautiful location. She refuses to let that bear rob her of her enjoyment of the outdoors and was hiking with Seamus soon thereafter, minus one of their beloved partners. As they walk, Seamus glances around, still searching for his brother Angus. For those of you wondering what became of the sow and her cubs, no action was taken against them. Her behavior was classified as within the expected behavior of a sow grizzly protecting her cubs from what she perceived as a threat. Wow, that was a real tearjerker, folks. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Did Seamus and Angus contribute to an aggravating aspect of the bear attack, or would that sow have attacked Patty anyway? Would a firearm have changed the outcome of this attack? Would it have made any difference if Patty hadn't run away from the sow? Frankly, I really doubt it. Finally, do you think Patty may have lived because Angus was watching out for her after he departed? The thought of a little fluffy guardian angel makes me smile. I'll enjoy reading and replying to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Mount Emmerich, about nine miles west of Haines, Alaska. The Chilkat and Kicking Horse River deliver fresh glacial mountain meltwater to the Chiclat Inlet before eventually flowing into the Gulf of Alaska. At the top of Mount Emmerich lie still unnamed glaciers, and it was first summited in 1976, well after Mount Everest. The climate on the mountain is listed as a tundra climate, with cold, snowy winters and cool, wet summers. It's a granite mountain that lies in the St. Elias mountain range. Mountain goats are known to balance on the cliffs and crags, but not much else can scratch out a living on Mount Emmerich. There are no wolves or cougars here, but lower on its slopes you will find brown bears. 35-year-old Forrest Wagner grew up in Fairbanks and had made a living as a mountain guide on Mount Denali, as well as a high-altitude guide internationally. For the last 10 years, he had been an assistant professor at the University of Alaska Southeast in the state capital of Juneau. His background allowed him to teach outdoor leadership, ice climbing, backcountry navigation, rock climbing, glacier travel, crevasse rescue, and mountaineering courses. On April 18, 2016, Wagner had planned to take one of his classes out to the Juneau Ice Field, but poor ice and snow conditions had him choose Mount Emmerich as the location instead. The six-day expedition consisted of Wagner and two teaching assistants, as well as 11 students. The 18th was the fifth day of the expedition, and they were now descending the mountain. They were at about 2,000 feet in elevation and had strung out a bit to skin up their skis. When climbers skin up, they place a slip-resistant cover, called a climbing skin, over the bottom of their skis. 
This allows them to use them in much the same way snowshoes are utilized and permits movement across less than ideal skiing terrain. They'd planned to remove the climbing skins once they reached an area more favorable to skiing for their descent from the mountain. While the group placed their climbing skins on their skis, Wagner skied ahead inspecting prospective descent routes and possible difficulties. Now the Alaska Department of Fish and Game had issued a public notice at the beginning of the month that bears would likely be out of their winter dens earlier than normal this year. The winter had been more mild than most, and skunk cabbage and other greens had already begun to bloom. These nutritious sprouts are one of the first foods bears seek in this area after emerging and are Mother Nature's way of inviting them to do so. It is known to local scientists that brown bears in the area hibernate at elevations up to and around 2,000 feet. By himself and leading the expedition, Wagner had not brought a firearm, nor bear spray on the trip. Bears were supposed to be hibernating for a few more weeks, and aren't regularly seen on the barren slopes of Mount Emmerich. Shortly after skiing to an overlook, Wagner gazed out at the terrain and looked for a viable and safe way down the last stretch of the descent. Unbeknownst to Wagner, he had skied right past the small opening of a winter den of a sow grizzly and her two cubs. Given the insulation and protection of the den and snow around it, the sow likely hadn't heard or seen Wagner until he was very close to the den opening. She exploded from the opening and bounded toward Wagner, instantly enraged by his proximity to her and her cubs. Wagner lifted his arms above his head and waved them while yelling at her. He was hoping she could see he was a human and not a threat to the three bears. He didn't get to wave his arms too much before the sow plowed into him, knocking him to his back. Wagner was trained in a wide variety of survival skills and strategies, but as is all too common in bear attacks, didn't immediately follow the modern conventional wisdom. Instead of playing dead, he fought back, trying to get the bear to stop her attack on him. According to onlookers, the sow's attack was brief, consisting of rapid bites to Wagner's side. As she tossed him around, the battling duo approached a cliff's edge, but were too focused on each other to notice. As they tumbled over the ledge, Wagner somehow landed before the sow. The fall was only ten feet and may have done the damage noted to Wagner's leg, but having the enormous sow land on top of him may have added to it. After using Wagner as her landing pad, the sow clambered back up the slope in search of her cubs, while Wagner's expedition members made their way toward him cautiously. While waiting for help, Wagner began administering first aid to himself and utilizing his training as a wilderness first responder. With the bear and her cubs a safe distance away, the students quickly put their learning into practice after arriving. They placed bandages on their professor's wounds and made him as comfortable as possible, while one of them searched the mountain for a spot to place a call for help. An emergency call to the Alaska State Troopers was completed, and they wasted no time in contacting Temsco Helicopter Service for a lift. A group of heliskiers were dispatched to find the group and an acceptable landing spot. The heliskiers arrived and began prepping the professor for evacuation as his students gathered nearby. The students were nervously discussing the event when the bear reappeared near them. An armed state trooper who had arrived stood by them, acting as security from another attack by the sow. Wagner was originally going to be flown to Juneau, only 90 miles to the south. After assessing the seriousness of his injuries, the medics decided to fly him to Providence Alaska Medical Center in Anchorage, located 500 miles to the north. By 4 p.m., Wagner had arrived and was being treated by the waiting emergency medical teams. While Wagner was on his way to the hospital, UAS Chancellor Rick Caulfield was contacted. He arranged a second helicopter to evacuate the students and was waiting for them at the ferry terminal upon their arrival. He made sure the school's counseling services were made available to the students after experiencing the traumatic event. Wagner endured ten surgeries over the following weeks and hours of painful rehabilitation. Skin grafts were placed to cover the damage done to his side, and his leg was also surgically repaired. By the end of May, he had been released to return to his home in Juneau to finish healing. The bear attack wasn't enough to derail his plans for teaching the following fall. Following the attack, Wagner indicated that it was his privilege and obligation to share and participate in adventure settings in the natural world. He stated he harbors no ill feelings toward the bear, after all he's been through. As for the sow and her cubs, her behavior was found to be within the expected and normal behavior of a mama bear protecting her cubs. Nothing was ever done to her or her two cubs by the authorities. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I have a few questions for you. 
Even though brown bears were supposed to be hibernating, do you think that the expedition planners should have prepared for one anyway? Should a man with such a breadth of training anticipated running into a bear after reaching the lower elevations? Why do you think the sow returned to the attack site? Would you be up to this much adventure in your life? I think I'll take a pass. I'll be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Lincoln Lake in Glacier National Park in Montana. The lake sits at an elevation of 4,849 feet high and is nestled between Lincoln Peak and Mount Jackson. The pine, fir, and spruce trees here are thick and mixed with quaking aspen throughout. Willow and berry bushes complete the emerald tapestry that soothes the minds of observers while offering picturesque mountain scenery that human artists dream of painting. Common animals in this area include white-tailed deer, elk, and moose, with predators like coyotes, bobcats, cougars, wolves, and bears prowling the land. The park has always been a stronghold for wildlife, and bears in particular. Grizzly bears were once rare here, but have since rebounded to sustainable populations. Black bears have always been common here. In fact, some park visitors would say they are all too common. In the hot month of July 1972, hikers have been accessing the backcountry utilizing the trail system while they explore. Their exploration sometimes infringes upon locations of forest animals violating their privacy. One such incursion brought two park rangers, Michael Ober and Dave Shea, to a campground and the trail system near Lincoln Lake. A bear attack had been reported the prior day, and the rangers made their way by horseback to the Lincoln Lake trail system. As they arrived, they could see a disheveled and chaotic scene. The victim's crumpled tent told part of the story, and in the bushes behind it lay more clues. A downed sleeping bag had been ripped open with its white and gray feathers strewn about. Following a dangling cable designed to suspend food caches, the rangers found a backpack on the ground. It had clearly seen its better days, with tears and rips in its fabric indicating a bear's angst for the human interloper. Scattered around the campground were random items that caught the bear's attention for one reason or another. Cans of food and containers bore punctures made by the bear, but whether it was hungry, curious, or expressing anger at the human scent present could be debated. Surveying the scenery and trying to decide where to begin, the rangers examined some of the items. Following the attack the prior days, they'd been tasked with retrieving the camper's personal belongings and making sure nothing was left behind. There were food wrappers and empty containers laying all around, but it wasn't clear if they'd been bagged before the bear invaded and scattered afterward or during. It may have retrieved the items from a trash bag, but if the camper had left them around like that, then he created the environment that had led to his attack. The lakeshore gave up its portion of the story as well, with black bear tracks indelibly pressed deeply into the mud. A nearby pile of bear scat was analyzed by the rangers by using a stick to separate it. The bear had passed a cheese wrapper and a portion of a plastic spoon, which couldn't have been comfortable. The victim of the attack, a backcountry hiker and camper named Randy, indicated that the bear chased him up a tree. For some reason, the bear came up after Randy and pulled him from it at a height of about 25 feet. The rangers approached the tree which bore the claw marks of the bear on its trunk and a smattering of limbs around its base which had been knocked free while the bear climbed. Using their binoculars to more closely examine the tree, the rangers could see broken limbs and claw marks made as the bear climbed in pursuit of Randy. The gashes in the bark told a desperate and terrifying aspect of the attack. Before gathering Randy's belongings, the events of the prior days flooded back to Ranger Ober's mind. For park rangers, this time of year requires in-person visits to each backcountry campsite to evaluate them for safety, cleanliness, and upkeep. The campsite at Lincoln Lake was an 8.8-mile hike in, then the same hike out. Given the time of year, Ober decided to travel the bulk of the route in the early morning hours to beat the heat, and hopefully the flies. Ober had only traveled a quarter of a mile up the trail, and had been lost in watching his boots as they found footholds up the initial climb of the trail. As Ober stepped, his vision was filled with something straight out of a horror movie. He stepped back as the form of a man appeared on the trail, only a few feet in front of him. 
Ober's initial thought was that the man was dead. In his hand, he still clutched a flashlight. Dried black blood covered his head and neck, and flies swarmed around like miniature vultures waiting for their opportunity to feed. The stench of rotting blood and body odor combined to create a nauseating smell that tested Ober's gut. Staring into the man's face, Ober searched for a sign of life in his swollen eyes. After a few seconds of staring in disbelief, Ober heard the man stammering something. His statement was a warning to Ober. Don't go in there. There's a bear. It's his home. He lives there. What Ober didn't know was that the man's name was Randy, and he had been attacked by a black bear after pitching camp along the Lincoln Lake shoreline. The bear had raided Randy's camp in the early morning hours. Randy had fled up the tree in an attempt to give ground to the bear and avoid an attack. The black bear pursued Randy up the tree and repeatedly bit into his bare feet. Each time it bit, it would try to pull Randy from the tree by using its weight to overcome his hold on the tree's limbs. It took the bear several attempts at this, with each attempt ripping gashes into Randy's lower legs, ankles, and feet. In its final and successful attempt to pull him down, Randy fell the 25-foot height as his head bounced off of tree limbs on the way down. One of the limbs caught him under the chin, jamming his teeth together and ripping a hole through his tongue. As he hit the ground, Randy's head slammed against the soil, breaking his nose, cheekbone, and the small bones of his eye socket. After crashing to the ground, the bear must have fled, which allowed Randy to grab a flashlight and cram his gashed and torn-up feet into his hiking boots. With his retreat lit by a flashlight, Randy made his way almost nine miles back toward the Lincoln Lake trailhead, where Ober had found him. Ober helped the exhausted man to his feet and assisted him down the remainder of the trail. Periodically resting, Randy would explain to Ober additional details of his predicament. He explained that after he'd set up his camp along Lincoln Lake, the bear had mauled him early the following morning. Since the attack, he had hiked through the night, sometimes at a snail's pace, until he heard cars passing. At times their headlights would flash through the trees, so he knew he was close to rescue. Unable to walk any further, this is where Ober had found Randy, laying on his back and exhausted. Once the two men emerged at the trailhead, Ober drove them in his car to a nearby ranger on patrol. In the day before, assistance was as close as the other end of a 911 call. Hospitals were the best option for life-saving support. Ranger Hyatt's patrol car was soon headed to the hospital in nearby Whitefish so Randy could receive medical assistance. The medical staff immediately set out cleaning and suturing Randy's wounds. The circumstances around his appearance had drawn the morbid fascination of the hospital crew, who doted on Randy so they could get a glimpse of his wounds. Ober contacted Dave Shea and filed the incident report as soon as he had gathered all the information needed. His superiors directed the two rangers to return to Randy's camp and round up his possessions the next day. As Ober prepared to head to Lincoln Lake, two adages came to his mind. When a leaf falls in the woods, the eagle sees it. The deer hears it, and the bear smells it. This saying is a tribute to the bear's keen sense of smell, but the last one is a tribute to their majesty and power. As the retired park ranger and grizzly bear attack victim Jerry DeSanto was quoted as saying, Wilderness ain't wilderness unless there's something out there that can get you. If there was no other lesson from Randy's bear attack, let the main lesson be that you should never camp dirty in bear country. After reviewing the harrowing tale of Randy's bear attack, I have a few questions for you. Would you ever expect to escape a bear attack by climbing a tree? Would a firearm have changed the outcome of this attack? Do you think you would be tough enough to hike nine miles through the dark with gashed legs and broken facial bones? I doubt I could, and I don't want to find out. I'll be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.